you know, I think when you work in that world, right, kind of, um, you get used to the big numbers, right? That's kind of not how I wanted to live my life. I knew that if I continued down this path, um, no matter how much money, you know, was thrown at us, um, I would never see it. But I think the biggest thing for me was, you know, I, want, I, I needed a lifestyle change in my life, right? Um, you know, I wanted to be around for, you know, my kids, my family. Coming to you from the mobile home park capital of New York City, Staten Island. This is the Mobile Home Park Exchange podcast. I'm your host, Frank Rizzo. Joining me is my co-host, Eric Busitzel. How are you today, Eric? Doing good, Frank. Great, great. Eric, we have a very special program today. And it's special because it allows us to actually cover two topics in one episode, which is which I love because we're able to cover two things at once, which I think you know gives you extra value for listening. So the two things we're gonna cover today. And one thing we really don't talk a lot about on this program, I mean, we, we share a lot of our experiences and a lot of our you know, tips from working in the manufactured housing space, but we really have not talked about our team. So today we're going to highlight a team member who's come on board as we've built out our investment platform. And we'll talk a little bit about him and what he's done. And he's been a tremendous value add over the last few months that he's been with us full time. But secondly, and, and most importantly, I think having him come on is really, I think people, Eric, take a little bit about what we do for granted in the fact that hey, you and I have been in real estate for each over 20 years. Right. So when we say that we're running in a real estate investment company, it, it's not a big surprise, even though it was a transition from transactional, right? You were handling transactional mortgages and you shifted over to real estate investments. And for me, on the sales side, to shift from transactions to the investment side, but it's taken as almost, that's what happens. You're in real estate, it's that one catch-all. But you know, as we talk to Peter Falcone, who's joining us, he actually made that shift that everybody talks about. He moved from the corporate world um, to working full-time on his investments with us and Stone Capital. So with that, um, I'm going to introduce a friend and also uh, a partner at Stone Capital, Peter Falcone. How are you today, Peter? Good. Uh, thanks for having me on board, finally. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you were able to schedule it out and share some time with us today from your busy from your busy schedule. Yeah, all right. Uh, it's good to be here, and you know, I uh, you know since I came here, it's kind of it's been a total change of my past life and. You know, I spent 10 years in banking, you know, I worked at Moody's, I worked at CIT Bank, which is now First Citizens, and my last stop was JP Morgan. Um, you know, and it's over the 10 year period, right? You know, I had a lot of great experiences, worked on a lot of big transactions, market moving transactions. Um, you know, when at JP Morgan, which is my last stop, you know, we worked on a lot of merges, uh, a lot of acquisitions, take privates, uh, we finance, you know, the biggest and the best, the 800 pound gorillas in the room, um, you know, Blackstone, KKR, Brookfield, Cerberus, you name it. Uh, we've worked with a lot of joint venture partners and, you know, it's a total change of pace now. Um, at JP Morgan, right, we had a, uh, everything was just one phone call away, one, you know, walk 10 steps, you get the answer, right? It was just an informational platform um, filled with the biggest and brightest minds, right? But there was always something missing. And, you know, I think when you're doing that and working 16 hour days from 8 a.m. to 11, 12, two in the morning, um, routinely, right? You, there's always something eating at the back of your mind and it's what, what do you really want to do? And, you know, I had a great time there, worked on a lot of great transactions with a lot of great people, um, you know, and, you know, especially seeing a headline and like, hey, I worked on that. Uh, that was great. And, you know, but I think at the end of the day, I was missing was um, what I really wanted to do. And that was to be an entrepreneur, be on the investment side, be on the side that my clients were on. And, you know, on top of that, when you're working these long days, right, you know, I, so when I had my first daughter in April of 2020, 
two, um, you know, I saw her for maybe 20 minutes a day and then I would see her on the weekends, right? And that's kind of not how I wanted to live my life. I knew that if I continued down this path, um, no matter how much money, you know, was thrown at us, um, I would never see it. But, but let's take a step back because what you were doing, and, and I think you kind of brushed over it, and for people who are listening, I, I don't know if they realize exactly what you were doing. I mean, you were running the CMBS desk at JP Morgan. You were underwriting a lot of these transactions and you underwrote a lot of transactions in the manufactured housing space, right? So specifically, like what types of trans if you if you can say, what deals did you work on and what was the scope of the transactional size that you were doing when you were underwriting those deals or taking those deals to the investment committee to see if you were gonna finance those deals. Right, that's actually a good point because, you know, I think when you work in that world, right, kind of, um, you get used to the big numbers, right? And, you know, so this, when I, when I was at JP Morgan, uh, I worked on the large loans team, right? So it was a specially carved out team that worked on basically anything that was 200 million and above. Um, you know, I had a couple of smaller deals for lack of better words that were, you know, $60 million range. Um, but the largest deal I worked on was over 4 billion. And, you know, that was that deal, um, that was a take private. And, you know, we worked on a lot of numerous transactions. We financed half of Vegas Strip. We took private numerous companies. Uh, we uh, financed the American Dream Mall that's over here in, in the Meadowlands. Um, and it's also seen a life cycle too, right? So we finance everything from casinos, hotels, industrial, manufactured housing, multifamily, uh, self storage was another big one. It did about four billion worth of self storage, and we had great partners on, on that too, right? Um, you know, love working with our clients there, we, and you know they'll eventually be lifelong friendships, right? But you know, when it came to manufactured housing, that was that was fantastic. Um, you know, I did two of the last three securitizations in the past call it ten years um, at. JP Morgan, and you know, one was for Apollo, the other one was for Horizon Lanco, um, both large transactions. But the most interesting part was like kind of getting to the bottom of barrel and like really understanding MH. And I think the biggest value add, right, was you know our exposure to each other prior to those financings, where I was able to learn the ins and outs of the manufactured housing space and be able to really see what's happening at the portfolio level. And you know, one one financing was about 130 properties. The other one was about, um, say, close to 150 properties. And you know, it's really understanding the difference between you know lot only, park owned homes. Uh, what's the business plan to infill those vacant lots, right? And you know, being able to hear the clients talk about their uh, business plan and really understanding, okay, like that's actually possible. Right, uh, because a lot of times when you're getting into, when you're financing, right, your clients are spinning a bigger business plan to you than what's actually reality. And when they kind of put it together in this space, you know, having learned a lot from you two, uh, it really kind of said, okay, you know, became the go-to for uh, manufactured housing during my tenure there. And so we had a, you know, we had a few other deals that we uh, financed and looked at um, that were on the smaller scale. But uh, at the end of the day, the, the best part about it was, you know, kind of being the go-to for that. And you know, when people were looking at a deal, they say, hey, like, you know, here's the situation: is it possible to bring lot rents from three hundred dollars to five hundred dollars? Like, is that too much over a period of two years, three years? And you have to, you know, this, you know, if they go, oh, it's a 50% increase in lot rents, like, is that possible? And, you know, you have to kind of take a step back and say, hey, like, you know, well, sure, it might be 50% increase, but, you know, in actuality, it's a couple hundred bucks and it's bringing it to, mar to market lot rent. And so, you know, teaching people to learn, take a step back and see it from a different lens because they're so used to seeing office rents, multifamily rents, um, you know, industrial rents increasing, you know, 15% or 20%, right, mark to market, which is bringing it from the current lease to the new lease. Uh, you know, th these are just eye-popping figures to them. And at the end of the day, 
thanks to you two, right? It, it was, I was able to communicate that to my co coworkers and colleagues and say, and really spin the business plan. And both of those deals are doing very well right now um, that we securitize in the CMBS world. So, so Pete, you mentioned a lot of, uh, you, you mentioned several different asset classes that you worked with over the years, right? Casinos, storage facilities, um, you know, and I, I look back and we've talked about why we decided to really, you know, delve into the MHP space. Um, but I didn't really have the exposure that you had on that high level to these different asset classes that you have and that you mentioned. Um, if you had to say, like, what was the, I mean, or, or in working in that corporate environment, um, was it as exciting seeing the MHP space? Um, like, what was it that, you know, drove you towards that space? Because, you know, a lot of the other asset classes that you mentioned, self-storage has been super popular over the last several years. Um, you know, refinancing malls of that size, the American Dream Mall. Um, tell, tell me a little bit about the talk from the corporate world about the MHP space. And, and I would imagine that towards the end of your um, position at JP Morgan, is when you really focus primarily on MHP, right? Because I think that's when it became uh, the most popular in the last couple of years. Yeah, so it's actually a good point. Uh, so MH was always, you know, uh, the black sheep of real estate, right? It was never really popular with the institutions. Um, you know, some institutions dabbled early, which, you know, worked out great for them. Um, you know, but you know, if you're taking, let's say you're taking a regular apartment building, right? You're like, oh, you know, I'm going to put 20,000 a door into each apartment, right? Into kitchen, bathroom, whatever. And, you know, then I'm going to increase my rents from $1,500 to 2000 or, you know, something along those lines and bring it up to market, right? You know, it's all about amenities. And so the difference about MH, which really started picking up steam, I would say, in about 2020. 2021 uh, with the institutions. Everybody wanted to get involved in it. Now you're seeing funds launch, you know, which we obviously launched one of our own um, that we're currently raising capital for. But the thing about MH is it's, it's really a different asset class in real estate. And the best part about it is, you know, it's, it's known as low income housing for the most part, right? And there's a few outliers in the US that are, that don't fit in that bucket, but 99.9% .9 of the time, it's creating affordable housing, a community where people can live and really enjoy, right? Um, there's different ways for to make your residents happy, there's, and there's a ton of different ways to um, make money in the mobile home park space, right? And it's from the lender's perspective, right? It's, oh, it's, you know, it's kind of, you know, you're taking up lot rent, what are the expense ratios, what are, et cetera. But I think, um, when you really dive into the operations of MH, right, you're starting to see, you know, what really turns the gears, right? Um, you see how much work there really needs to be to bring community from a one-star community to a three-star community. You know, you're thinking about infrastructure, you're thinking about homes, right? You're thinking about skirting on homes, you're thinking about where uh, plants and signage are located, right? You're thinking about different amenities that can attract, uh, you know, residents to your community. And, you know, that's that's kind of what really drives interest in the space. You, you hit some great points right there. And for us, you know, to get a little personal, we've actually had a relationship for eight years. So you had been almost like our secret weapon Right, because you had, from the very beginning, through us knowing each other through mutual acquaintance, acquaintances and sitting down, you had been participating with us on the on the investor side, right, as a limited partner with us on a lot of our syndicated deals, and you know our model has always been very inclusive with the people that we're involved with. So if people wanted to be involved, you know, we love sharing and kind of showing people what we're doing and educating them along the way because when you have strong-minded people or people who could bring a different skill set it you know I, i'm firm believer and eric shares this that you know iron sharpens iron and it makes you better and so we would go through a lot of the opportunities that you know set that would come to us and you would underwrite with us 
even before being part of the team, like be, being officially part of the team, but you were always there in the background. So you were kind of allowing us to have this, you know, we had this institutional look at at the assets that we were acquiring that we were able to share with our, our other partners on, on these opportunities. But as you mentioned, you had a Rolodex of, of deals and, you know, obviously other funds and investment companies that you were participating with, you know, and that you had obviously facilitated some very large transactions. So what drove you to choose, you know, because you obviously had options. What drove you to chose, uh, choose Stone Capital or to to join, you know, Eric and you know, myself on, on this journey. Um, I think that's a, a great point, right? Um, you know, being at the institutional level, right? The, the money was unlimited, right? And, you know, the harder you work, the more you made. And, you know, I think the difference that really set Stone Capital apart was, you know, I always obviously wanted to be an entrepreneur, be in charge of my own investments. And, you know, I got my feet wet working with you guys, um, you know, for, about three years until it became official, right? And or four years, but longer, right? On the LP side, um, you know, I did my first investment with you guys, and you know, started to really understand, um, you know, kind of how it worked, right? Uh, and then, you know, when once COVID hit, we kind of got more involved. Um, but I think the biggest thing for me was, you know, I want I I needed a lifestyle change in my life, right? Um, you know, I wanted to be around for you know my kids, my family. Um, but with Stone Capital, right, what really set Stone Capital apart from everything else was uh, the fact that, you know, we're really inclusive when it comes to our investors. And, you know, you see all these ads for passive real estate investing, right? But how many how many uh, of those firms can really pick up the phone and talk to the principals involved? Uh, the principals invite you on their trips, right? Um, you know, the principals, you know, ask, you know, this for you to come in and, you know, we walk you through the business plans, right? You know, you really get excited. Um, you know, I think that's kind of what set it apart, right? Was the fact that, hey, we're a great team. You know, we've got 40-ish employees, uh, you know, I think a tad over that. Um, but at the end of the day, it was um, what value we can bring to our investors and really kind of growing the investor base and growing the platform and the success that we've had to date. Pete, you, you've definitely, um brought some big value to our team. And I think, you know, I mean, for me anyway, I mean, and you asking them that question, uh, Frank, I mean, same thing for me. You know, I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. You really want to be around people that are going to sharpen you and work hard and, you know, kind of have the same vision and goals. And, you know, you've, you've definitely come in and um, I don't want to say you work as hard as me. But you <laughs> almost work as hard as me. Um, but but yeah, I think you, Eric been, likes the fact that you def deflect a lot of the energy that I would give into his office. Now I now I bring it to you, so it's it's like he gets half Frank energy and not full Frank energy. Yeah, right? I mean Frank walks in every day and you know starts boxing, um, you know, <laughs> at, at his shadow, and he's like, "Oh, come on, are you ready? Are you ready?" <laughs> you definitely want to work with people that you you like and enjoy and have similar goals and um, yeah, the 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 flexibility. I mean, listen, we 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 work very hard. But, um, you know, I, I would imagine it's totally different than, you know, uh, traveling into the city, working 18 hours and then getting home and seeing your kids a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it is right. Like, you know, it's you know, I would get in at 8 a.m., 8, 15 in the morning. Right. And then I would leave it, you know, anywhere from every day. It was at, at least 11 o'clock at night I would leave. Right. And, you know, sometimes two in the morning and then sometimes uh, often we had to go out with clients and, you know. And we don't them. mind doing that. The reason why we don't mind doing that here is because we're doing it for ourselves, right? right? And we're doing it for, like you said, our investors that we have these, you know, close relationships with. And, you know, that was a great point that you made. Um, you know, we do have these special relationships with our clients, which become our friends. And, you know, I feel that, you know, here we do give them the opportunity to be involved in something that is different than just, like you said, a you know, an ad that they see on, you know, Instagram or Facebook. And, um, you know, we're, we're definitely involved a lot more. It, so, so now that you've been here for a period of time, what would you say was the, maybe the biggest surprise that you've, that you've noticed or something that maybe exceeded expectations or that was different than what you 
you know, anticipated stepping in, right? Because, you know, obviously we came in, this was a conversation that you and I had had, had um, for, for a while. It wasn't, it wasn't something, it was a decision that you made lightly, but we had talked about this. But now that you're here and you kind of, we lifted up the skirt, you're on the inside. What do you see? What's, what's been the biggest shock to you that you think? What has been the biggest surprise from being, because now you're on the buy side. You know, what has been the biggest shift from your perspective? And, and I think in answering that question, Pete, um, I mean, you did it at a time where the market has really changed, right? Which, you know, takes a big pair. Uh, and you made that move when the market was was really changing and you had a, a great position where you were um, and, and, you know, you pulled the plug in a, in a, in a changing market. Yeah, I mean, it's... Um you know, that, that's actually a good point right in the middle of the market change. Um, you know, the market really started changing when, when the Russian-Ukraine war uh, picked up and interest rates started skyrocketing and the Fed's combating inflation, right? And we were, you know, in the middle of our fundraise um, and, we, you know, we're still raising capital for our fund, right? But, you know, I think it's the, the constant excitement, right? Working for yourself, uh, working for your investors. And, you know, every time we get a deal like, hey, this, this deal works, you know, let's, let's make a bid on it, right? Um, the institution acquisitions really scaled back, you know, to the tune of, you know, up, up to 70%, right, uh, pullback. And, you know, the difference with us is we can still make the deals work, right? And, you know, some deals are still a wide bid ask between buyers and sellers, right? But um, the excitement, like, hey, this deal works, like, you know, throw an offer in. And we got, what, five, six offers out right now, you know, a bunch of LOIs trying to negotiate PSAs. We're closing on a deal next week, right? Um, you know, that stuff's exciting. You know, being on the buy side, right, you're actually you know, um, able to coordinate and you're in charge of your own destiny, right? You're in charge of your investors' returns and constantly thinking about best ways to um, to improve your performance, right? And your performance is fantastic to date, right? But what can we do better? Um, when you're on the institutional and lending side, it's, you know, you get excited when you win a deal and you go into closing mode and then eventually when you close it, right, you know, but then the deal's done. Then the deal's done, right? You know, you pitch your investment committee, you know, a bunch of times, right? Um, that's it. Once you once you close the deal, see you later, right? Here you're living with the decision. Yes. Here here you have to live with your choices. They're irreversible, right? Um, so you really have to be sure that you're making the right decision. Um, and you know, that's why we constantly talk and you know, we play uh, pros and cons, devil's advocate, right? What works Tenth for man. Yeah. yeah. You know, you can't just say, oh, yeah, you know, F it, like, it's it's going to work. Like, you know, just throw the, throw the bit out there. And, and, and I think you and I probably butt heads the most when we when we look at different opportunities um, now, because you're looking at it, obviously, from the from the numbers underwriting. What is this going to look like? Let's look at this assumptions. Let's sandbag the numbers as much as possible. Um, so this way, we know that it works in the worst possible environment. That this this still ticks out and hits our metrics, right? So we know that we're going to be able to perform, and that within 24 months, you know, this is going to be generating over a 10% cash on cash return for any capital that's been deployed, right? That's been our model from day one. And you know, you and I will, you know, butt heads on, you know, assumptions to make sure the numbers are right. You know, going over with Eric, you know, how can you know how fast can we infill those lots? What our cost is going to be in in terms of the improvements? What is wanted? What is needed? Um, what's been the biggest? You know, what 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 what's the biggest takeaway you have from that? Because now, you know, again, where we started, you and I. I mean, we you were living with the decisions because you were participating with us and helping us in the underwriting, but now you're actually seeing what it takes to make it work, right? like in real time and part of the conversations. Like, well, I, I'd like to point something out and I don't want to answer your question, but, um, you know, Pete's a, you know, uh, spreadsheet guy. Like he sits in front of spreadsheets all day and, you know, coming from corporate world, like I remember when you first really started becoming involved with us, um, you really didn't understand a lot of what was going on this side. And I think that's, and, I, and I've seen that, change right because i mean you used to call me up and ask me like the most basic questions and i was just like question mark in my head because you didn't understand a lot of the stuff that was happening on the ground i guess you didn't see that part um working in the institution and and you've really um 
you know, evolved into, I think, something totally different now because you've had the luxury of, you know, looking at it from high level, just spreadsheets, just numbers, um, the big picture to now really seeing the operative standpoint. Uh, that's a great point, right? You know, in the institutional world, everything's data driven, right? Um, and not that we aren't, we are very data driven, right? But it's really getting out in the field. Right? How do you get there? You have to, you have to get in the field and really see these, uh, the changes occur before your eyes, right? Like when you finance something that it's okay, you know, you go do a site tour and wherever we traveled all over the country, um, you know, sometimes four or five different plane flights, you know, just to see your portfolio, right? Um, but you're only just doing a quick glimpse of it. You're there for an hour at the property, you know, kind of walking through really, you know, okay, that's that. Um, and the owner is showing you the best face forward because they want to get the loan done. Exactly. Yeah, but that, that's a good point, right? There was one site visit that I was on where, you know, the property was marketed as, you know, one thing, right? And then we saw two out of the three buildings and I was like, well, well we go into the third building. It's like, hey, you don't need to go in there. Like you saw it all, right? Like they leased 100% of the space and walk into the, like, you know, I eventually convinced them, like, we have to go into that building. Like, I'm not doing the deal unless I go into that building. And, you know, I see the, the property is st still being worked on. Like there's four out of the, six or seven floors that still have, you know, construction on. I'm like, what's going on? Oh yeah, we're, we're subleasing the space. And we're, well, like, you know, that was not disclosed to us. Like that's actually can be an issue. Um, we ended up working out at the end of the day, right? But um, that was a big deal too. That, that was quite- Can't get that from a spreadsheet. Yeah, exactly. And, and you had your first visit, site visit with us, right? Which was an extended where we spent, you know, I, I think it was like, we made you spend multiple days, you know, Together we were down on site, right? And that, and that was like your first extended visit. What did you, how did that change your your thought process in that, right? In that time. Right, and so it, it, I think the biggest thing about my first site visit, right, was that it's not just a numbers game, right? Um, it could work on a spreadsheet, it could work, you know, when you're reviewing the P&Ls every month, right? But really being on site helps you understand this, the operations, the scale of the operations that we have, um, you know, the changes that we really make from a property that is a one-star property neglected by the, you know, previous uh, sellers to what we do, right? And we're changing the infrastructure, right? The time frame to, you know, execute the business plan. Once you change the infrastructure, then what can you do, right? And it's really trying to run as many parallel processes as possible in order to really drive revenue and performance at the properties. Um, but being being on site really gets you excited, right? And that's why we try and push a lot of our investors, I think, to come with us, right? Because uh, when investors come, they really see uh, with their own eyes the projects that we have going on, and, and it truly does drive excitement. And that's not just a market; and, it's and, true. And and the opportunity, right. because if everybody that anytime somebody's come down and seen the opportunity, I think they've all came in there and they were just they were they were wowed with what's there, what's in place, the potentiality of the space and of. You know, I, I'd say the business plan that we've we've put together, where we we make communities better, and by making communities better, that creates the value for the resident, because at the end of the day, it's about that consumer experience, and that makes them want to stay and become more attached and tethered to to what we're trying to build. Right. So, so that's that's been great. So I, I'm going to say this. I mean, one of the big value adds we had last year. Uh, and I would say probably the most important thing we did. I mean, I know we launched our inaugural fund, um, but to build out that platform, it's 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 putting the right people in place. Bringing Pete on was the the best value add. If we we went down the list, it was top on the list of of things that we've done and we should be super proud proud of from the investment side of how we built out the platform of Stone Capital and what we're looking to do. So I want to, um, we're super happy to have you part of the MHP Exchange podcast, that being part of your dream of moving over to the buy side and that you've joined with us. I think that's been a tremendous value add for us. Um, we're looking for great things to happen with that, Pete, and we're expecting, you know, we're expecting great things with you on board. Uh, Eric, anything you'd like to add? No. No, I think you hit it on the head. Talk about value add. You know, Frank, Pete is uh, the epitome of value add for us. Um, sure we, we definitely <laughs> learned a lot from you. Uh, and I really enjoy, you know, you, you know, getting on Frank a lot and taking a lot of that off my plate. You know? <laughs> but, but, but that's what investing should be about. It should be about living 
the American dream, moving over to the buy side and being able to control your own destiny, right? And that's why we do what we do to put you on the path to financial freedom. So if you have a question about anything we talked about in this episode, hit one of the links below, DM us your questions. We love to answer some of your questions and share your story with us as well. If you've moved over to the buy side or if you're looking to escape your nine to five and wanna know how, reach out to the MHP Exchange podcast, the MHPExchange.com, your source for news, information, education, and listings in the MHP space. This is Frank Rizzo, and this is the MHP Exchange podcast. Until next time.